squat uh, FT8 transceiver and the case um, is circuit board. Pretty slick. So no microphone, just the jack, huh? Well, yeah, it's just got the audio in and out in the back and uh, it's synthesized. So you can put it on the FT8 frequency, FT4, Olivia, RTTY, you can do any sound card mode through it. But the first button on the front panel puts you on the FT8 frequency. The second one you can redefine as to any other frequency. It's kind of slick. Okay, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute everyone. Just be prepared to unmute yourself. All right, and so it should right. be working. You're back. So welcome everyone. Joe Eisenberg, k 0 nd is going to talk to us about techniques and kit building. Yeah, know. Mitch, you're a little low on kit. audio. Kind of a fun you're, part of hobby. Yeah, Mitch, your audio levels. Okay, a yeah, low. I got to talk it for this one. Okay. Okay, you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, Joe, take it away. Tell us about kit building. All right, I'm going to share my screen out and uh, see if that works. And uh, yes, we see it. I'll bet that's even better. How about that? Full screen? Yes, we got you. Okay, very good. All right, I'll give a little quick introduction to who I am. Um, if anybody goes to Dayton, You'll see me wearing that hat. I do not wear it at any other ham fest, although I made an <laughs> exception for Friedrichshafen uh, back uh, in 2014. Otherwise, I have other hats I wear for different ham fests, but you will see me with the camera. Uh, I was first licensed in 1969. Yes, we worked each other as novices, I think. Uh, my Elmer was Leo Meyerson, W0, get fat quick. And uh, he was famous for founding and operating world radio laboratories in Council Bluffs, Iowa, across the river from Omaha, where I grew up. And so I took my novice classes, my code and my theory at uh, World Radio Labs in Council Bluffs, where I got to watch them build my first rig, which was a Galaxy GT 550. Uh, I'm originally from Omaha. I work there often, but not full time anymore. I'm mostly retired. Um, I live in Lincoln, Nebraska, 45 minutes from there, and I'm an IT field tech. Um, but like I said, mostly retired. I work maybe about a day a week. And hopefully by the end of this year, that'll be done too. Uh, I've written the monthly kit building column in CQ magazine and done photography for them since 2009. Uh, if you look at the January 2021 edition of CQ magazine, the cover story is about my uh, tower restoration project where I stripped the tower clean and we put up all new antennas, all new cable, all new grounding, new feed lines, remote coax switch, all sorts of improvements to my station that were long needed. And so if you have the January 2021 edition of CQ Magazine and you look at the front cover, that's my roof. And those are three of my friends on the roof and on the tower uh, putting things together. Uh, I'm also the author of the construction techniques chapter in the ARL handbook and done so since the 2014 edition. And in addition to taking pictures at HamFest, I enter my best artistic photos every year in the Nebraska State Fair, which did not happen this last year. Hopefully it will this year. I made my first trip to Dayton in 1975. And since then I've spoken there 30 times. And every year I set a couple of slideshows, one or two to music so that you can enjoy the memories of Dayton Hamvention. I try to make them funny and I try to make the pictures work with the words of the songs and those are all on YouTube. So let's talk about the kit suppliers and see who's in and who's out. Number one, qrpkits.com. Uh, uh, just a huge variety of kits that have been tried and true and uh, very popular. Um, 
qrpguys.com is a relative newcomer, although some of them were involved with the uh, development of some of the kits from the previous one. Um, and their kits are very affordable and very innovative. Uh, they have some neat kits. Uh, 4sqrp.com is the four state QRP group. And that's who made that uh, Crick key. They also made the Cricket, which if I can find it, I will show it. I don't know if I buried it around here or not, but um, the uh, Cricket is a, uh, oh, there it is. I've got it, uh, a QRP transceiver. And uh, I'll show that later on. Uh, and it's very innovative. Uh, Velleman uh, makes kits. They're sold through Jameco and other online vendors. I think even Amazon. Uh, Elenco is also a kit maker. Uh, they make things like an AM FM broadcast radio kit that has a schematic on the circuit board and great beginners kits. Elecraft uh, is probably some of the, the most well-documented kits out there. Um, extremely well-written manuals. Uh, some of their kits are modular, it means you don't solder. Some of them, like the K2, which has been around, I think, 15 years, is still being sold, and it's still uh, put it together, and you'll spend about 40 hours or more building a K2, plus more if you put in the options. But... Uh, uh, Elecraft makes some of the, the best kit radios in the world, uh, uh, but there's not as many of those now as there used to be. Uh, DZ kit is also well documented and all their surface mount parts are already done for you. And their manual even looks like the old Heath kit manuals. MFJ makes a ton of kits under the Vectronics name. Uh, not a lot of new ones. The, the latest one was a couple years ago when they took uh, one of their antenna tuners and made it into kit form, and uh, which is kind of fun to put together. Uh, Nightfire kits are a lot of uh, more simple kits, very inexpensive, uh, 10 $15 kits, and they are available at vakits.com. So if, if you wanted to freeze a frame, this is kind of the one to uh, freeze because I've got some uh, uh, suppliers here. QRPME.com is right down the street from you, or at least kind of. <laughs> he's in Maine, which means he's a lot closer to you than he is to me, and that's Rex, uh, W1REX. And he has the tuna tin kits and rock mites and things like that. Um, Chinese suppliers. Uh, are out there, and there's a lot of very inexpensive, simple kits, uh, very useful. Uh, Heath kit is is in, but they only make a couple of different kits, and uh, I don't know what their status is lately. Um, there's a lot of clubs like Four State QRP, uh, New England QRP, and so on that that make kits as well. And of course, the original Heath kit is gone. Ramsey, uh, excuse me, Ramsey Electronics used to make a lot of kits. Uh, they're gone and Tentec as well. So before you begin assembling your kit, uh, I kind of suggest making a list of things that you need to use or test it once you put it together. Um, you might need uh, things like a, a headset or a speaker, or a key or a paddle. Uh, an antenna or a dummy load. And a dummy load is really important because a lot of these kits are QRP. Uh, even if it isn't, uh, a lot of them don't have VSWR protection. And so if it's uh, loaded into a, a wide open or a uh, dead short or something, you're gonna damage that output. So make sure you have a dummy load on hand for when you first power it up so you can see if uh, it's putting out the right amount of power and so forth, and you're never going to damage the output as long as you have that 50 ohm load that can handle the amount of power it's putting out. Do you need 12 volts? Do you need AC power? Um, do you need a 9 volt battery, a double A, triple A's? What do you need to light this thing up? Um, kind of go back to the top of the list. Um, when you're building a kit, I, I would never suggest that any kit builder 
ever start even on the simplest kit unless they have a multimeter. And there's really no excuse now for not having one because you can go to Harbor Freight. I don't know if they have them there in Vermont, but uh, uh, the meters sometimes are even free with a coupon, three bucks, six bucks. You're not gonna pay more than about six or seven bucks for a meter. And of course, it's not as good as a fluke, but it's plenty good enough for 90% of the kits I've ever put together. A, a, a Harbor Freight meter will work just fine. An oscilloscope is a fun thing to have and good, so you can look at your signals going in and out. Um, once again, uh, some kits you might really need that, some you don't. A reference receiver is very useful, and that would be especially if you have built a receiver and you hook that up to an outside antenna and you hook up the headphones and speaker and stuff and you hear static, but you hear no signals. Well, sometimes you have to get it in the ballpark and so on to get it in the band. But what if you're not hearing anything? Well, you want a reference receiver so you know if the band is dead because we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle and propagation really, really sucks. And so we don't want to go trying to troubleshoot a kit if we didn't know that 40 meters or 20 meters was dead. Uh, tuning tools are a must. Um, I have a few of them around here. Um, don't know if they're easily grabbable, but um, uh, tuning tools are necessary um, because you're not gonna use one of those little pocket screwdrivers or so on to adjust your trimmers. What you're gonna to wanna to have is you're gonna to wanna to have a plastic tuning tool that you can adjust things and not introduce your capacitance or inductance to that circuit. Uh, I've had people bring me kits that they uh, took a hex uh, key set to it and of course shattered the, the ferrite core in the slug tune coil with that, let alone took it out of band. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you have plastic tuning tools. And once again, online, I've seen them on Amazon for about five or six bucks for a whole set of those things. So they're very affordable right now. Now ESD is a big problem. It's the reason why I did not do any building at all last week because when it's minus 31 outside, doesn't matter if you have a humidifier or not in the house, my humidity was like 18%. When I raised that 31 below zero air up to about 65 to 70 degrees inside. Electrostatic discharge is that kazap you feel when you hit something metal when it's very dry. But a lot of ESD you cannot feel. In fact, only about 30 volts of ESD can wipe out a CMOS IC or component. So I could do a whole nother seminar on ESD, but uh, it's best to look it up and uh, learn how to best protect your station and your uh, work surface and your kit building area against ESD. Um, the work surface should be something that uh, doesn't get harmed by soldering. Uh, my holy grail is cookie sheets. Uh, they have a set of three of them for like six bucks at Walmart. Uh, that's three different sizes. They're not non-stick or anything like that, but uh, uh, they have a lip around it so that parts don't uh, roll off and you don't lose surface mount parts or things like that. A board holder is sometimes nice uh, if you're working with certain types of components. I have a small one and then I have a larger pan of ice type. Uh, there's a lot of homebrew bo board holders as well out there. Uh, a lot of people don't use them at all. Uh, but I like it uh, when there's certain types of components or assemblies that I need to do and I want to hold that board up. Um, the manual, uh, some kits come with a printed manual, uh, but the vast majority of kits do not. Sometimes they come with a little sheet that just has a web address that you go to and you can download um, a PDF file or a Word doc file, and you can print that. And I highly suggest using a color printer if there are color photos in there, because that helps a lot for you to identify parts and locations and so forth. Uh, I don't suggest using a laptop anymore because when you clip those leads and they go flying, they can get into that keyboard and then the, the laptop can blow up. And I've seen laptops blown up like that at work. Uh, tablets work real well, like an iPad, because 
the uh, pieces of uh, wire that go flying bounce off the glass on the front. And because they're in a case, the, the plugs, jacks, connectors, and so on are quite recessed. So the odds of getting something in there is pretty slim. So once again, the, the, the little pieces of wire might bounce off the uh, front screen of the tablet, but it shouldn't hurt it. And you can pinch or stretch the pictures so that you can get a closer look, especially if they used high-res photography, like I like to do. And you can see a close-up of those pictures and diagrams of where the parts go. Uh, some things you want to keep on hand. Uh, this is kind of my... Uh, a uh, big thing I like to emphasize, and that is assortments of pre-sorted standardized parts. And you can buy these assortments. I found them at HamFest. Uh, a lot of HamFest, there are people that sell these. Um, you can also order them from like Jameco and, and DigiKey and Newark and other uh, parts suppliers. And I see somebody showing a capacitor kit. Yeah, Joe knows, I've seen those. And uh, that's the kind of thing you wanna have. Uh, I get common values of resistors, capacitors, diodes, transistors, and ICs. Um, and I have all those parts nice and labeled and, and pre-sorted just like he was showing, uh, I think it was Jeff showing. And uh, it comes in, in great handy. Uh, there's multiple reasons for it. Number one, if you're working on Sunday night, don't forget there aren't very many Radio Shack stores out there anymore. Um, so what you gotta do is you got a 10K resistor missing. Well, I can go through my, my assortments in a drawer or in boxes or so on. I can quickly find that uh, 10K resistor and I'm back in business. But there's a lot of times when a kit comes out and then they discover that they changed a supplier like on one of the transistors and it still works, but you might need a different bias resistor or something on that. It seems to work better. And so uh, a lot of times they'll say, oh, if you change that resistor to a 680K resistor or something like that, or a 3.9K, um, that it works better. Well, it's good to have that stuff handy. Uh, sometimes they might say, oh, if you put another bypass capacitor here, it gets rid of this noise. So it's always good to have those standardized parts on hand. Um, nine volt battery snaps, battery holders, sometimes are not supplied with kits. Uh, so it's good to have, especially if you're putting it in the case. Uh, there's a lot of plugs and jacks that are commonly used, such as your quarter inch, your eighth inch, uh, two and three conductor style. Uh, plugs and jacks, RCA phono plugs and jacks, PL259s, all sorts of adapters like uh, one kit I was going to show has an RCA jack for uh, the RF output. So I have an adapter that adapts that to an SO239. I also have one that adapts it to a BNC. So you want to have all the plugs, jacks, connectors that you think you're going to need for your kit to talk to the outside world. Now, most kits uh, that take outside power in use 12 volt coaxial power plugs. And these are usually center pin positive and the jacket is negative. Most often it's 2.1 millimeter. So if you find somebody selling a bunch of 2.1 millimeter uh, plugs at a ham fest, uh, make sure you get a few of those. Uh, some places I've seen those sold as a cord where it has either a red and black or a black and a white stripe. So you know the polarity, but always check the polarity of the kit to make sure that the center pin is positive and check the polarity of the pre-assembled wire if you get one like that to make sure uh, which polarity that stripe is. Uh, I have never made a kit that I didn't make some kind of mistake or something. Uh, so you want to have some things to deal with desoldering, like solder wick. Not very expensive. Uh, at HamFest, it's like a couple of bucks for a little roll of solder wick. Uh, solder suckers. Um, there are hollow-tipped irons that have uh, 
uh, squeeze bulbs that you can suck up solder and so on. And there's the plunger type and so forth. And when you're dealing with enameled wire, you really want to have an emery board. But I also keep an emery board on hand because some of these kits, especially the ones that use PC board material for the case, you snap those apart. And when you do that, it makes kind of a rough edge. And so I use an emery board and it's very easy. It doesn't take long. You're not gonna be filing forever. Usually it's two or three passes with an emery board makes it uh, very, very smooth on the edge of a PC board. Um, soldering iron is probably one of the most important things to look for. I look for one that fits my hand comfortably, 15 to 30 watts or so, variable temperature. Uh, I look for something that takes a variety of tips because you don't want to be using a bigger tip uh, or a thicker solder than what the size of the pad on the circuit board is. That way you kind of avoid the problem of uh, solder bridges and shorts and things like that or filling an adjacent hole. Um, you can tell if it's ESD safe by looking to see if it has a three prong plug. Um, look for one like this that has a holder so you can put the iron safely so you don't get burned and has a, a place to clean it. This particular one has both a sponge and a brass cleaner with flux. Uh, this particular uh, soldering station also has a solder roll holder, which is really, really handy. Uh, so your solder doesn't go all over the place. This particular one sells for under $60. Uh, it's available through Amazon or eBay, and you can get free prime shipping from Amazon on this. Uh, it controls the tip temperature down to plus or minus two degrees Celsius. And the newer version of this uh, soldering station has two kind of a gooseneck clips that come out of the left and right side. And those are good for holding things like uh, plugs and connectors and wires together, kind of like a helping hands to, uh, to solder. Uh, that's in the newer version of this. Um, actually commercial soldering stations like your wellers and stuff that you see in businesses that actually do soldering professionally, uh, they control their temperature plus or minus two degrees Celsius. And so for getting one under $60, it does all this and holds your roll of solder, I'd say it's pretty good. It's available at xtronicusa.com. And when I first heard about these, I had no idea where they were. And then somebody told me, oh yeah, I ordered one and it came from Lincoln, Nebraska. And I said, well, that's where I live. And I, I looked it up and made an appointment there and visited the place. And indeed, these are not manufactured here. They are manufactured overseas and then they are shipped in bulk to Lincoln and repackaged. And they are uh, sold, like I said, through Amazon and so on, but the fulfillment generally comes from right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I need to visit them to see what's new. Um, when you're building kits, it's good to have a variable voltage bench type power supply that's metered. It's good to have simultaneous viewing of the current draw in amps as well as the voltage that you're supplying because some kits need nine volts, some need six volts uh, and so forth. So you wanna be able to uh, adjust the power supply to what you need and then keep a meter on it and having that uh, current draw on there. If you're building like a Pixie QRP and it's drawing two amps, I'd say you've got a problem. So uh, I would I would guess something's getting hot. So it's always good to have that meter on the power supply to show you right away how much current it's drawing. A frequency counter is useful also. Those have come down dramatically in cost. Uh, oscilloscopes, when you go to ham flea markets, I have found Tektronix scopes even under $100 before flea markets shut down. And I'm guessing after this is all done, like this summer when I go to Huntsville and other big flea markets, there's going to be a lot of CRT scopes out there because a lot of guys are replacing those with the, the new solid state um, LCD type scopes, but a good CRT scope is great and it lets you see what's going on. Uh, there are oscilloscope kits online as well, and that's a, a link to those as well. Uh, once again, we talked about a dummy load and vacuum desoldering. 
uh, is a device that I, I use more because I, I build a lot of kits. And what it is, is it's a soldering iron with a uh, hollow tip. And then you pull a trigger on it and it sucks the solder into the tool. And then later you clean the solder out of the tool. Uh, the Heiko 808 looks like a giant old style Weller soldering gun, but it works well. And there are bench types where you have a console and a small hand trigger. A general coverage receiver is really good. Uh, once again, you can check your band conditions. It's good for entertainment as well and testing, listening for your local oscillators and your BFO and so forth and IF. Um, an AM FM clock radio is also worthwhile, helps you keep track of time. Uh, and all, the only thing I caution on that is uh, I listen to my favorite music station because if you're listening to talk radio, I don't care if it's left or right. Uh, it's only designed to tick you off and we're, we're building kits and we're having fun. So uh, I listen to my favorite classic rock station when I'm building kits. A random wire antenna, a piece of wire strung out the window uh, is very easy to do. And uh, I use that for testing receivers from crystal sets all the way to HF. Uh, a solder roll holder. Uh, I have one that holds two different types of solder. Here's my doctor's prescription for the kind of solder I use. I use 6337 uh, solder, 031 or 025 thickness, rosin core, no clean. And the reason I do that is I don't end up with those brown blotches of uh, uh, rosin on the bottom of the board. It looks a lot nicer. Uh, 6040 solder has been traditional, but 6337, when I visit my customers that are electronics manufacturing plants, uh, they all have nice HACO soldering stations and they use Kester 6337. And the reason is, is that 6337 is what we call eutectic solder. And it, it melts at only a couple of degrees, like five or 10 degrees cooler than regular 6040 solder. Uh, but it wets a lot better. So what that means is that in hand soldering, instead of wave or, or automated soldering systems, when you're hand soldering, it has a much shorter plastic state. Now, what that means is uh, when it's cooling down, you're not going to as likely get a cold solder joint because it solidifies a lot quicker. Um, and when I say it wets, it, it, it uh, flows real nicely down the lead right in through the hole of the circuit board, fills it up, and sometimes gets a little through on the other side of the double-sided circuit boards, which is just fine. It holds the part in real nice. Um, but the 6337 by far works a lot better when you're hand soldering and uh, it looks better, looks nice and shiny. And uh, the rosin core no clean is the best version of that. Um, I like to find storage because I cannot build like a 300 component part, uh, part kit uh, in one sitting. So you want to have uh, something secure to keep everything sorted and secure between your building sessions. Because the enemy of all kit builders is cats. Okay, left is Tesla and the right is Newton and he's 21 pounds of all cat. The uh, thing I like to sort kits in is the Plano 1354. They still make this. Uh, it is available in black and white at some of the home improvement stores. Uh, it's mostly this color if you buy it as a tackle box. I've seen it at craft stores in pink and lavender, but the only difference is the color of plastic on the outside shell. They are all the same. And so it has four trays that pull out and each tray has movable dividers, so you can sort all your parts uh, in there. And then I put the larger parts like kits, uh, partially built circuit boards, uh, other larger parts that might not fit in the uh, uh, little snap uh, trays and the instructions and, and partially completed things, things like that go in the top. Everything else goes down the bottom. So when I go to a group kit build experience where we're all building different kits, I can just bring that with me and take my pick of four different kits that I'm working on and start putting it together again. 
So when you're sorting parts, this tray here on the right uh, is an example of one of those that comes out of one of those Plano uh, kits. And uh, like I said, you can get them at uh, Cabela's or uh, Bass Pro or uh, some of the other outdoor places, as well as um, hardware and uh, like Menards or Lowe's or places like that, um, or craft stores. Now you can use a cupcake tray uh, or the tackle box thing. Uh, you can ground a cupcake tray because usually they have a little hole in them to be hung up on the wall. So you can take a, a nut and bolt and a solder lug and, and put a one meg resistor in series and ground that so that uh, it's not only grounded for static, but uh, you won't get any noise or anything off of it. Um, cupcake trays come in 6, 12, or 16. My trick on any of these things is to sort the parts I most often use in the cups closest to me. In this one, besides those capacitors in front, you see the resistors in, are in the lower left. So they're in the front left. And then I have a different style of capacitor that's there in the middle. And then I have the disc caps on the right. And then I move back behind that and you see the electrolytic caps. And then you see some parts and then you see some transistors and on the left, I have diodes and RF chokes that look kind of like resistors, uh, but they are RF chokes. So you want to be careful of that. Uh, since resistors are usually the most numerous, I usually have those the closest. The things in the back are the things I either use first or last, and they are the larger parts. You got your toroids, your knobs, plugs, jacks, connectors, pots, things like that. Um, some kits that are more complex, uh, we use stage by stage construction. This particular kit, uh, you'll notice uh, I have all the cups resized to fit the parts. And you'll see I have a little piece of paper and I have a number in each cup. And what that is, is that's the stage that I'm building. So for instance, if I'm building the power supply, there may be three or four parts in that like a regulator and a filter cap and diodes and resistor or something like that. And so uh, the way stage by stage kits work is you build a stage and then you test it as per the instructions. So you get it right. As you can see, I just kind of go back and forth through this. And this is how we build a kit uh, stage by stage. Now, the exception being these pots and large pieces and so on that may not conveniently fit with these. But the idea is um, you're building from the power supply onward. And so you're going to test that before you continue on. So if a, if a kit is that complex, they're going to have the instructions and the suggestions of what you need to test that stage. Most often, it's going to be a voltmeter. So what you do is you put together that stage and then you do those tests. You don't keep going, you do those tests first. And once again, if it doesn't work, uh, you can fix it before it's a lot more difficult to find it. Because if you mess up the power supply and you just put in 300 components, well, you're never gonna find what's wrong. So what we do is it might say you got three volts here and you got 6.8 volts there and you got 12 volts there. And if if those voltages are present at those parts of the circuit board, guess what? It works. Um, once again, usually they go to the audio stage next. And so once again, they'll have you take some readings and so on, uh, test it by listening for hum or buzz or hiss or something in the headset. Uh, once again, if you don't know uh, if it doesn't work, you stop right there. Now, maybe you only put in eight parts, but then you only have eight parts to figure out, did you put the diode in backwards, use the wrong resistor or so on. And the neat thing about it is when you finish that stage in a stage by stage kit, there should be no parts left in that container when you're done. So that's a double and triple check. Once again, have the right test equipment available to test that stage before you go on. Uh, a lot of kits have no sequence at all. You got a parts list, 
and a marked circuit board and you just throw things together. So what I usually do on those is I start with the resistors first. I kind of work up the hierarchy of electronic parts. I go to the capacitors and then I do the diodes and then the transistors and so on and work my way up to ICs. And then there's less common parts like chokes and toroids and stuff that I might have to wind or, or place in the special position. Uh, once again, look at that board and look at the documentation that comes with it to see if there's any notes uh, about like you might want to put this part in before that because it might get blocked if you put that part in first. Uh, and once again, make sure that the supply of each type of part is exhausted once you've completed all the installation. So uh, if you've got 10 resistors in that kit, there shouldn't be any uh, left in the uh, in that tray if that's all you needed. Now, sometimes you're going to have extras. Uh, it could be that they accidentally put uh, an extra part in your kit. It could also mean that there's options in that kit. Like, let's say a Pixie has different uh, values of capacitors and so forth for different bands. So if you building it for 40 meters, you might use this value capacitor. If you're building it for 20, you might use that. 80 meters might be a whole nother different one. And some manufacturers will put in all those parts because sometimes it's just less expensive to mass produce them if you just throw in all the parts. So guess what you have when you're done? You wanna make sure that you still used all the parts and that there's no open slots for any more resistors and so forth on the board. And I always double check to make sure that each part went in the right uh, position. And then if you have those extra band option parts or something, I put those away in my standardized parts sorting. And that way we have uh, extra parts in case uh, we want to change the band or in case uh, we need it for something else. The trouble with toroids, and this is a problem because a lot of guys uh, don't like doing them. Uh, I know people that avoid kits that have them, but really, if you look at this, look how nice and neat that is. It just take your time and do it. Uh, follow the instructions meticulously. Now, I'm going to give a hint that a lot of guys do. And what they do is they do the toroids first. And they're usually marked like L1, L2, T1, T2, or something on the circuit board, but obviously not on the core. And so what they do is they wind the toroid the exact number of turns and so forth that's called for. And then they strip the leads and so forth, as I'm going to describe in a little bit. And then they put them in a tray in their part sorting so that when that step comes up in the kit, all they do is throw that on the board and solder it, just like a resistor or a capacitor and so on. Now, if you look at this particular one, this is not just an inductor. This is a transformer because I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, you can see there's a two turn uh, secondary there uh, or primary. And then you can see the other. Now, what we do when we're winding a toroid, you'll notice this wire doesn't quite make it all the way around, but we still count that as a turn if it goes through the middle of the donut. So what I do is I start counting on the inside of the donut. And if I have, let's say it's a, a 20 turn toroid, if I have 20 wires going through the middle of the donut, then I have 20 turns. Uh, once again, the turns are as they go through the center of the core. Uh, what I do uh, on some of the uh, kinds of enamel wire we call thermalies, and a lot of times the kit maker will tell you that, uh, if it is thermal wire, uh, you can take uh, your soldering iron and turn it up all the way as far as heat goes, and then I put a, a hot blob of solder on the tip. And then I take that blob and I put it right up next to that end of the wire that's close to the toroid. As you can see down here, it's kind of shiny, but then there's insulation down there. And so what I do is I heat it up and after a little bit, you'll see a lot of smoke come off of that. So you might want to use a little fan, like a chip cooler or something to blow that away. And I, I draw that uh, away from the toroid uh, slowly so that what it does is it melts and burns off the insulation and at the same time it does what? It tins the wire. Um, now there's some real thick enamel 
uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, wire that the kit maker gets surplus from uh, motor windings or something. And sometimes the enamel on that is very thick. And so the trick I use on that is I use a cigarette lighter and I burn it off, but it really doesn't come off. It just chars it, makes it black. But that makes it a lot easier to file off real quick. I use the emery board to make it nice and bright copper looking. And then I take the soldering iron and I go down that same lead again and I tin the wire. That way, especially on a double-sided circuit board, it's making a good strong mechanical and electrical connection on both the top and the bottom of the circuit board. Uh, and that avoids a lot of issues because those inductors are what either determining your RF filtering or your local oscillator or in regeneration, uh, the regeneration in a regenerative receiver. Uh, once again, make sure the leads are tinned before you put that on the circuit board. Um, and don't, don't melt too much insulation. And once again, take your time and enjoy the experience. Toroids are not that bad. Um, they're, they're actually uh, just another part of building the kit. Uh, there's common mistakes. Some RF chokes look just like resistors, so check their markings. Uh, double check your electrolytic and tantalum capacitors for the correct value and polarization. Uh, use a magnifier, especially when checking eighth watt resistors and small capacitors. And use a meter if necessary. I use a component tester, which helps as well. Or in the case of resistors, just a, a digital meter. Uh, watch your diode markings. Make sure the stripe is in the place where the instructions tell you it should be. Uh, and on those little tiny glass diodes, bend those leads very carefully because they can be very fragile. Uh, those glass diodes, the tiny RF chokes, and those itty bitty capacitors are very vulnerable to being broken if you bend the leads too much. Um, this is a component tester. You'll see a number one, two, three on the on the bottom left here uh, picture. And that's so you can put three different leads. Now it doesn't come with test leads, this particular kit. It sells for about $12. And uh, you'll probably have to find a case or make a case for it. And what we do is we take three colored different clip leads. So what I do is I get a bag every once in a while, those colored alligator clip leads and I cut them in half. And then I strip them and then I just pick three different random colors as long as they're all different. And then I tin the end of the wire and I put it into those three terminals. And the way this thing works is it will, if you hook a resistor and it doesn't matter which of the uh, three terminals you hook it to, like one and three or two and three or one and two, uh, you hook it to that and you push the button. It comes up, it says what your battery voltage is. Then it says, oh, this is a resistor and it's 998 ohms. Well, there's your 1K resistor right there. If you put a capacitor in, it tells you its value. If it's an electrolytic, uh, it also has the equivalent series resistance, the ESR. Uh, it'll tell you if a transistor is NPN or PNP or if it's uh, a MOSFET, and it'll tell you on the PNP and NPN which of the three leads goes to the collector base emitter. On uh, MOSFETs, it's going to say uh, drain gate and source, uh, DG and S. It's going to tell you what they are. It's going to tell you the gain of the device, uh, and sometimes the voltage drop. Uh, like on diodes, it'll tell you the anode and the cathode and what the voltage drop is. Um, this thing, it, it finds out if there's an SCR or a thyristor or Darlington. Uh, it tells you all sorts of stuff. Inductors, it will tell you not only the inductance, but it will tell you the DC resistance as well for 12 bucks. This is a great kit to put together. Uh, the instructions are kind of bad Chinese English or some better instructions you can download. Uh, but as you can see, all of the parts values are marked on the board. So it, it's not that bad to put together. Now, if you don't want to do that and you want to have still a kit experience and have an even better one, this one sells for about $18. And uh, this uh, I got this from Wired Co., but uh, I don't think he has any right now because there's no ham fest going on. Uh, but uh, I have been able to find these online uh, through Banggood and 
uh, AliExpress and some of the other Chinese sites. Uh, this one, I took a simple NPN, <coughs> excuse me, transistor. And you can see it says one, two, three, one, one, one. So that's like the one, two, three terminals on the other. And you can take alligator clip leads once again, and you can uh, tin the end, and then you can slip those into this, what's called a ZIF socket and lock it in there. And you can have clip leads to clip to a part if you don't want to stuff it in that little thing there. And once again, it's telling me that this is an NPN transistor. It's got an HFE gain of 119 and it has a forward voltage drop across the bias and so on of 735 millivolts. So that's pretty slick. It's going to tell you what it does. It's great for unused, I mean, unknown parts. Um, I also use that a lot with those tiny little blue capacitors that are have like white print on them. And when I use a lighted magnifier, it's still hard to read it. I just stick it in there and it tells me what it is. The, uh, this one I will show you later. Uh, this one is a fun beginner's kit. It is an AM broadcast receiver and there's a zillion mods for it to make it even louder and better. Uh, all the parts... Uh, are listed on the speaker grill on the inside. And then, of course, one of the last things you do is put in the speaker to cover that up. Everything solders to pads inside there, not going through any holes. And the entire case is made out of printed circuit board material that comes with the kit. Everything comes with it, including the 9-volt battery snap and so forth. Um, but this one is, is a fun kit. It's based on the old boys' radios. Uh, from the early 1960s. And uh, it goes together nice and easy. And like I said, it solders to pads. So the advantage of that, especially for a first time kit builder is, how do you desolder that? All you do is you take your soldering iron, put it back on the pad and lift up the lead of the part. So if it's a transistor, you can just lift up each of the three legs and it falls just right off and it leaves three blobs of solder on there. Well, if you're putting another transistor in its place or repositioning the same one and so on, all you do is you heat up each pad and push it right back down and it's all done. So you don't need your solder wick. You don't need your desoldering tools or anything. This is a super nice way to uh, do a beginner's kit. Uh, this kit I use a lot in my group kit building experiences. Uh, this is called the Wall Wart Tamer, and I get that from qrpkits.com. It has a bridge rectifier on the input, so you can put uh, DC or raw AC up to 30 volts coming into this thing, like a doorbell transformer or HVAC, and uh, like a you know a heating you know a furnace transformer, like for your thermostat or whatever. You can get those at a hardware store, and it goes either polarity here. I use old laptop power supplies that I get from work because uh, uh, when they uh, decommission an old laptop and take all the data out of it, they uh, uh, smash the hard drive and grind those up and recycle those for security. But the power supplies were getting thrown away. I said, please don't throw those away. Uh, laptop power supplies are notoriously noisy, but uh, it goes through this and it filters it. There's an adjustable regulator and you get uh, anywhere from one and a half to about 16 volts DC output. Uh, but once again, a limit of about an amp and a half. You don't have to use this little 5K trim pot, which is kind of hard to adjust. You can just take a regular 5K linear pot and solder that in its place. And you can solder a voltmeter and so forth onto it so that uh, you know what it's doing. But this is a real nice, simple power supply kit. And you can see the holes drilled in it. That means it's designed to put in the case of your choice. Uh, this is the Cricut kit. Uh, this one, you don't have to wire any toroids. This is a CW transceiver. And with that 9-volt battery, we get right at 1 watt of RF coming out of this thing. It is crystal controlled. Uh, don't mistake this for the Pixies in that this receiver is really, really good. On the 80-meter version of this, with just a random wire strung out my window, I was able to copy the W1AW CW bulletins. And when I hooked my uh, KX2 to the same thing, it was only between an S1 and an S2. So it's got a really, really good receiver, uh, reasonably selective for what it is. 
Uh, you just have a headset jack. It comes with the straight key and you plug in the antenna. The newer versions of this also have a power switch over there instead of having to take the battery off. Uh, the crystals plug in there and away you go. The coils are pre-wound. They are spiral wound, so you do not have to wind a toroid. This is very innovative, and this is a design from NM0S, David Kripe, who will be doing one of the uh, other group kit builds on the online ham fest in a couple weeks. And he is a Collins engineer in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, this is another one of his kits. Uh, this is the Nouveau 75. And that also is available from Four State QRP Group. Uh, this one sells for about $100. It is synthesized. It is a 75 meter AM transceiver, but it also is general coverage AM shortwave broadcast from three megs to about 6.5 megs. So you can hear a couple of the shortwave broadcast bands. And this is what it looks like inside. See all those tiny little surface mount parts? You don't have to do those. You got 30 regular parts, including four toroids that you have to wind, but they're not transformers, so they're very easy to do. Uh, you have 30 regular components that you have to solder and put into place and you uh, solder the case together and you got yourself a radio in only a couple of hours. And that's what it looks like in the back and you can check that out at 4sqrp.com. Uh, some final tips, remove distractions, use voicemail, things like that, so you can keep concentrating on your kit. RTFM stands for read the fine manual. Uh, use a cookie sheet to keep those things from getting away. It also protects your surface so you don't leave any burn marks on your table. Have those batteries, power supply, whatever needed, as well as your plugs, jacks, cables, headphones, and keys, and so on, that you need to run your kit and keep those standardized spare parts on hand. Uh, keep your soldering iron tip clean. I clean my tip when I holster the soldering iron and I clean it again when I pull it out to start working on the circuit board. Uh, use good lighting. Uh, do not use incandescent light. I use only LED or fluorescent light. Take your time and enjoy the fun. And for Mitch, this is what I look like when I'm done with sweepstakes for the weekend. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty well shot. That's what I look like at the end of sweepstakes. So we're going to see if I can get my face back online. And I'll show you a couple of real quick kits. That is what the Cricut looks like. It is real nifty. And uh, this one you can see has the power switch up there. Uh, runs on a regular nine volt battery. And it's just fun to take that out to a picnic table somewhere, string a wire and make some contacts. Uh, this is a nice beginner's kit. This comes from the Nor North Fulton Amateur Radio Club in Georgia. And uh, uh, this is a simple uh, code practice oscillator. There are 10 components to solder in this and it's spaced well enough so that uh, it works well for uh, beginners. There is a jack on the left, and that is so that you can plug in a regular key. And so I poked a hole in the side of the Altoid so I could get to that. So you can hook that up to a keyer and so forth. Um, this kit here is the other end of the spectrum for code practice. And this thing comes from Austria, and it's called the Morserino 32. And uh, this one, believe it or not, you see all those surface mount parts, it only has 11 parts that you have to solder, but there's a lot of pins on some of those, but uh, only 11 parts to solder. Um, this one has a OLED display. Uh, it can transmit on Wi-Fi or on what we call LoRa, which is like, a, uh, like what they use for digital thermometers and stuff. Uh, so you can send CW to another one of these units across the room or through Wi-Fi. You can do it to anywheres in the world over the web. Um, let's see. Um, I think at the beginning I showed this. This is the FT8 phaser from Midnight Design Solutions. And uh, it has a nice case that was designed by AA0ZZ. And... Uh, uh, this is a single sideband 
transceiver designed for FT8, FT4, any of the sound card modes. And it's Vox operated uh, internally. So uh, you don't need to define in your uh, WSJT program. You don't have to tell it any kind of special radio. Uh, just leave that blank and uh, tell it it's using Vox and it talks to it very, very easily. Uh, this is a QRP guys version of the same thing. Uh, the plastic case does not come with the kit. Uh, that is the recipe file uh, was supplied with the kit so I could print that on my 3D printer. And that's a, a big trend now that kits are going to either the PC board case so that you don't have to spend all day drilling. Uh, and it's not that much more expensive for them to do that. Uh, or they give you the recipe that you can uh, take that file and uh, slice it for your own 3D printer. And uh, you can uh, print your own case. And that one took about four hours to print. Um, this is the uh, AM broadcast receiver. And uh, uh, it's not too bad. Let's see. Great idea. I hope it gets, because that is an arena they, they have never been able to even kind of compete in. So, so that's your uh, AM radio right there. Um, this is what the uh, Nouveau 75 looks like. And I think my time is up. So I'm going to give it back to Mitch. And I hope I got a few people enthused about building kits. So from Lincoln, Nebraska, this is K0NEB. Okay. Thank you. I liked it. <laughs> this is what I'm using for magnification, two and a half power optivizer. <laughs> right over my glasses. I know a lot of people use those uh, now. Uh, I use a... Uh, round fluorescent uh, magnifying light. Uh, but at work, we have these ones that have like 100 tiny LEDs in it, which you think, well, that that wouldn't look right, but it does. It makes this just broad, very soft, uh, white, bright light, and that works really good. So um, yes. yeah, the visors work good. There's all sorts of neat things that you can find at a craft store or Harbor Freight or places like that. They're really useful for kit building. Oh, yes. Somebody commented about the uh, uh, micro bit X. Uh, I've built two of those. The latest version, if you buy the case, uh, takes anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to assemble an HF radio. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding. And I've run FT8 on it and stuff, and it's wonderful. You get that from hfsignals.com. Um, uh, Hobby PCB makes a 50-watt amplifier kit that's good. Uh, they have all sorts of other kits. Um, Micro Center, yeah, somebody mentioned Micro Center. And uh, um, I see some other stuff. Uh, somebody asked what issue of QST. I wasn't mentioning QST. Um, I was mentioning CQ magazine. And the January issue of CQ front cover is my roof and my tower project and is the cover story in the magazine. Um, and let's see, Shirley, she says she uses the Optivisor. Um, yeah, reading glasses help. Um, uh, once again, the color temperature of the light is the most important because otherwise orange looks like brown and might look like red. And so the color temperature of the light is the most important. So you use uh, bright white LED or fluorescent. Uh, the incandescent ones uh, luckily are pretty rare now that you find them anywhere because if you let your hand go up and touch it, you're going to burn yourself. Um, and somebody said another, somebody uses those as a go box. Yeah, the, the, I have seen that as well. They put like two meters in it and stuff like that. Um, so anyways, one. Mitch, I, yeah, I see that board holder. Uh, those are actually a very affordable one. I think it's K2KI has it there. And that's, that's a really affordable board holder and it works quite well. It's pretty heavy, so it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, he's also showing a soldering mat and I use that from time to time as well. Uh, that's a way that uh, you can work on a kit 
And as long as you've cleaned it off, you can actually test it on a aluminum cookie sheet because it's insulated. Uh, the good thing about the soldering mat is, is that it, it helps ESD. Uh, they're magnetic. And so you can also put uh, screws in different places on there and it holds them in place. Yeah, this one has these little compartments where if you have some surface mount devices, you can set them in it. And it keeps them in place pretty nicely. Yeah, yeah, it does work good for SMD. All right. Anyways, uh, if there's no further questions, I think Mitch is going to switch this to uh, the panel, I think. Am I correct? It's still in this room? Yes. Okay, so yes, I'll... It's going to be in this room. So I'll, I'll keep my mic live in case there's any kit questions. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Joe. Great job. Uh, so a couple announcements before we get going. Um, we've been calling door prizes all day, and we've got uh, we need to give you a little bit of time to respond. So some people haven't responded. So if you go to the main page and click on prizes, if you see your name there, go click on the link in the bottom. Let me know that you accepted it. So we can get you your door prize. We also have the evaluation form up. We had some problems with it earlier. So uh, please do let us know how we're doing so we can do this better. Which is what we always try to improve. 